slowly faded in from the opening credits. The atmosphere was slow, melancholy and dark. We heard a slight echo of Peter's plea for Gwen to stay with him. There was nothing but the sound of rain splashing against the billboard. We slowly panned backwards as we saw J. Jonah Jameson reporting from the Daily Bugle. The vibrant tones of his broadcast contrasted the dark greys and dullness of the night, as well as the words he spoke. It's been nine days since the wall-crawling vigilante known as Spider-Man fought the Rhino in Madison Avenue. Since the attack, Alexis Savage has been placed behind bars once again in the Criminal Institute Ravencroft. The spider menace's whereabouts are still unknown, but believe you me, we will find you. We gently panned across the night city. The neon signs of stalls reflected the puddles below. The sky was dark, clouds felt like smoke. The city was almost lifeless. Tilting up from the uneven puddle, we saw Ravencroft. Its crisp white glow illuminating the frame became an eyesore. We heard the rusty cell gates spring open as loud, firm footsteps could be heard across the tiled floor. The sound echoed through the hallway. From the ambiguous long trench coat and dominating top hat, the gentleman was on his way to see his client. With his authority, the guards opened up the heavy duty locks leading towards the cell. Harry was in the corner of his room, chained up, laughing inconspicuously. Mr. Fierce would approach Harry with the news on Rhino's demise. Harry said they'd need to work faster to bring the team together. Fierce said he was working on it, but there had been some complications. But he assures him, Spider-Man will fall. As the dramatic sequence built, we sharply cut to a framed picture of Peter and Gwen resting on Peter's desk. Padding right, we saw passed out on the bed was Peter, unmotivated and tired. He was awoken by a hard knock at his bedroom door. Aunt May soon walked in and started cleaning Peter's room, waking him. May would tell Peter he can't stay in his room all day. He needs to be out, making friends and living a little. Peter was unresponsive. May tried to convince Peter about going to a support group. She claimed it held with Ben after he died. Maybe it can do the same for him. Peter said the last thing he needed was to sit in a room with other depressing people, talking about the people they've lost. I want to get better, not worse. May said nothing, looking at Peter almost worn out. She left the flyer on his desk by the picture as she walked out. Peter stayed in bed for a minute, staring across the room to the picture. He sighed as he slouched upward. He leaned his head against the wall before sluggishly walking towards the desk. He held the flyer up. He thought about what May said. He took one last glance at Gwen in the picture before he changed, for the first time since the attack. We cut to the flooded, depressing sidewalk as Peter was walking, hands in his jacket pocket. A look of sadness overwhelmed with annoyance as he made it to feast. He saw his reflection in the glass door. He sighed before walking in, already late as per usual. He sat down away from the group in the corner, unwanting of any attention. That was quickly compromised as the support worker turned straight to Peter and told him to introduce himself. He was caught off guard and reluctant. He looked in every direction, trying to find a response. After a minute of awkwardness, he tells the group his name and why he's there. The worker tells Peter about activities that can keep his mind preoccupied. Then the group started chiming in with their own experiences and it all got way too much for Peter to handle. It was like a panic attack. His heart began pounding. He sweated profusely as he stormed out. He huffed heavily as he placed his hand on his chest. He looked around seeing the empty roads as he decided he needed to go to a place to think. The only place he knew of that was quiet and where he actually felt something. We swiftly cut to a graveyard. It was iced up, cold, muted. We followed Peter's treacherous footsteps as the gravestone that laid ahead read the words, Gwen Stacy. Peter plummeted to his knees beside the grave. He held his right hand on the stone covering her name as a slight tear dribbled down his cheek. He struggled to find his words. He was shivering from the cold. Slowly, his breathing normalized. He looked at the hard, rocky ground as he caught his breath. He murmured and mumbled his words to the grave, expressing his deepest sorrows. He sobbed as the tears splashed against the ground. A few minutes of silence passed by as the camera panned Peter's right. There was a man watching him from the distance. He was old, but looked fairly familiar. Peter's spider sense fled. He jolted his head behind him, looking up. He stood to his feet and looked at the man dead in his eyes, almost like they had met before. The man claimed he didn't want to frighten him, as he stood two steps closer. Peter snapped and told him to stay there. The man tried to explain his appearance, but Peter was worked up. He yelled at the man, asking who he was. A second passed as there was a pause. I'm your father, Peter. Peter's heart sunk. He became speechless, lightheaded. You're not my father. My father's dead. 
He followed up with a singular shout as he asked him one more time, Who are you? The man reached his hand out to Peter, saying he knows this is impossible to understand. He spent years planning out what to say, but as he stands here now, he's short-minded, except that he's sorry, sorry for everything. Peter proceeded to get angry, frustrated. They stood closer and closer with each movement as Richard tried to explain his disappearance, to keep him safe. Aunt May, Uncle Ben, he had to disappear to keep them all safe. Peter grabbed him by his jacket and yelled in his face what it was he wanted from him, where he's been. He said he was dead. Richard said he was right here, he never left. I had to die to keep you safe. They would have called to me. I couldn't let that happen. I needed to disappear so Osborne could never hurt you or anyone. Peter was in shock, crying, bawling in fact. He just collapsed into his father's arms as they hugged tightly. Richard whispered he was sorry over and over as he comforted Peter, like any father should. The sun started setting as we saw the two on the bench, facing the countless graves in front. Peter would ask why he chose to come back now, of all times, why not sooner? Richard said that night he disappeared he was running, from Osborne. They set me up. They were coming after me, your mother, and soon to be you. I had to leave. They were going to use my work and sell them as weapons. The spiders, the ones that gave you your powers, were going to be used against us. I had to stop Osborne, so I destroyed all the spiders I could, but to make sure they could never replicate my work, I used my DNA to infuse with theirs, so that, without me, or someone of my bloodline, the experiment could never work. Norman came after my family. He had lawsuits against me, falsified evidence. I had no other option but to run and never look back. Me and your mother took a flight to Poland to lay low. We were going to work from outside the state to take Osborne down. But he got the jump on us and sent someone to kill us. Your mother didn't make it. But before she died, she told me that it needed to be there for you when you most needed it. Before the plane crashed, I managed to jump out. And it took me a while before I found land, but I kept going for you. I spent years gathering evidence against Oscar. Then I heard about Norman on the news. All of a sudden, things changed. Those plans to sell my work as weapons could now be possible. At least Norman knew the destruction it could cause. I thought maybe Harry or whoever came in charge would go ahead with those plans and it could cause so much destruction. That's why I'm here, Peter. I need you. We need to stop Oscar before they do something stupid. Peter was gobsmacked. He took a second to figure out his words. So you've been gone all this time and the only thing you care about is taking down Oscorp? What about me? Aunt May? Your brother died. You know that, right? Or did you forget about us, Dad? Peter, I know everything. You think I don't care about you or May or your uncle? I kept tabs on you throughout your entire life, making sure you were safe. I might not have been present, but I was always watching. I heard about Ben, and I'm sorry for everything, Peter. I did the best I could, but I'm sorry I couldn't do more. I want to make things right. I want to be here for you. So come back with me. Explain to me everything. I wish I could, Peter, but I died a long time ago in that crash. And I have to stay dead until my work is complete. We need to work together to bring down Oscorp. I'll never have to look over my shoulder again, and I'll be able to keep you safe. Think about it, Peter. No more worries. We get to catch up on everything we should have done over a decade ago. I'm not going anywhere now. Peter sighed, asking how they're going to take Oscorp down. Richard handed him a burner phone and told him he'll feed him information on Oscorp. His job is to sneak around Oscorp and find out everything you can about what Norman was up to before he died. Peter looked on the phone, seeing his father's number. For the first time in however many years, just having the chance to call his father, let alone see him, was something he never thought he would have the ability to do. He was taken back. He was lost. The clock struck midnight, reminding Peter of that fateful night. He arrived at May's, placing the phone in his jacket pocket. As he walked in, he saw May on the couch waiting for him. How was the group? She asked. Peter said nothing. He went to the fridge to get a drink as May got up. She asked him where he's been. Peter said she told him to get out of the house, so he did. So where'd you go? I went to go see Gwen. May sighed. I know how much you loved it, Peter, but this, all of this is not healthy. You need to move on. It's almost been a year. When are things going to change? Peter said he didn't need this, all this lecturing. He'll move on when he's ready to move on. 
and until then, stay out of it. Peter stormed upstairs. The feeling is running high after the emotional roller coaster he just experienced. He stared at his father's number. He looked back at the flyer May gave him. He looked back at the number as the music builds. We transitioned to a montage as Peter suited back up as Spider-Man and was working with his father to take down Oscorp. Richard worked from his secret lab in the subway as Peter worked on ground level taking down Oscorp's sister locations. Once they had the majority of evidence, Peter would take it back to his father as they built a strong case that would assure Oscorp couldn't buy their way out of this one. As the weeks progressed, Richard remembered a file he worked on at Oscorp. He told Peter he needed to collect it by sneaking in there. He told Peter the file was important, it'll help in the lawsuit. Before the break in, Peter was walking across Queens when he heard a woman cry out for help, similar to the way Gwen did. It had Peter's attention as he tried to pinpoint where the scream was coming from. Down an alley he saw a woman being mugged. Peter shouted without hesitation for him to let her go. He ran towards Peter with a knife. Peter stepped to the side, tripping the criminals he knocked his head against the wall and dropped the knife as it scraped across the floor. The old woman walked towards Peter with a handbag intact. She told Peter she was so grateful. She hugged Peter. Peter smiled for the first time in a while. He caught a glimpse of his watch and saw it was time. He told the woman he had to go. She offered a taco for his bravery. Peter sadly had to decline, but maybe another time. Peter started running as it cut to him as Spider-Man swinging across the city. The night seeped in as Peter approached Oscorp. The workers had left a little prior as Peter managed to sneak in through the air vents and into the main building. He disabled the majority of the cameras, not all of them, leading to his father's old office. It had been redirected to another scientist in the building. Peter broke the lock and looked around. He remembered Aunt May telling him that his father was a very secretive man, and no matter what, Peter knew his father had some secret still up his sleeve. He looked around, trying to find little buttons or latches, anything that screamed secret. As he continued searching, he found a compartment underneath the bookshelf. He broke the seal and lifted out the box, which was full of old files and papers. Peter grabbed them all and was about to leave when he heard a massive bang at the other end of the corridor. Peter went to investigate when his spider sense went haywire. He saw another burglar. It was a woman. She had icy grey hair, a black face mask covering her eyes and body armour that consisted of something military inspired. Peter would ask who she was. She smiled. She told Peter those looked like some interesting files he had there. Peter said he could say the same to her as we saw her holding a bunch of secret Oscorp files in her hand. Peter said he's gonna need them. The mysterious woman told Peter to back away. Peter tried grabbing the files, but her claws extended cat-like as they dug into Peter's wrist. He yelled in pain as she kicked him to the ground. The two tussled back and forth. The woman tried catching Peter off guard as she striked him in the face. Peter shot a web around her, holding her in place as he leaped over and grabbed the files. We want the same thing, Spider. Oh uh, yeah, and what's that? to see Oscorp fall. We both lost something, and it's time they face the consequences. How can I trust you when you just tried to kill me? Oh, come on, I got a few good hits in. This is over, the cops will be here soon. Oh, and what are you gonna say? You're broken here too. Like I said, we're after the same thing. Check the file if you don't believe me. Peter saw the phrase, special projects listed on the cover. As he opened it up, most of it was redacted, but Peter came across the plans Norman had intended for a group of specialists in armed combat to wear highly weaponized armor that would wage fights in their favor. The cat told Peter they need to be stopped before the plan can take place. Peter said nothing. The cat told Peter they need to work together. Peter hesitated, but soon cut the web around her, freeing her. Peter said he'd be in touch. He took both the files and left. Before he swung away, he looked back to the building, seeing the cat fleeing. Peter grabbed his phone and called his dad, informing him of the files. We cut to a blacked out car parked on an abandoned street. We saw the gentleman inside with a laptop on his knee. Peter had forgot to disable a few cameras and now the gentleman was now aware that Peter was stealing Oscorp's files. He was onto them, or so he thought. They needed to move fast. He told the driver to go as we saw a detonator in the gentleman's hand. We sharply cut back to Ravencroft as we saw Harry leaning against the bars in his cell. He was whistling, a fixated version of the classic Spider-Man theme. On the last note, the walls exploded and the prison was set ablaze. One of the Ravencroft guards opened Harry's cell and handed him a gun. Harry laughed, the goblin side coming forward as a massive prison riot unfolded. 
Harry shot out his way, killing guards and prisoners in his path. We cut to a shot of the outside as we saw Harry make it out of the prison walls. Everything was on fire. Harry was laughing demonically as he emptied his clip into a guard in front. As he made it to the front gate, a helicopter lowered. The door slided open as Harry got in, closing it behind him. We cut to the inside as we saw Harry. He had a bullet wound in his arm from the riot as the gentleman passed him a bandage. He asked why so soon. The gentleman said they had a little problem. Our friend Spider-Man has been sniffing around our business. He's onto us. So where are we going? I set us up in a warehouse outside the city, along with everyone. Harry paused. He was everyone. We cut back to Peter and his father at the lab. Peter handed Richard the files and told him he was right. They're planning on using potential biological weapons. He wants to set up a team of them. Villains, bad guys, whatever you want to call them. We need to stop them before they're formed. Peter had a faint linger of spider sense. He was led to the TV. He turned it on by the remote as he saw the bugle reporting on the recent compromisation of Ravencroft and the disappearance of one of its inmates, Harry Osborne. The potential breakout could possibly be connected to the recent break-in at Oscorp a few short hours ago. We cut to Peter's shocked face. He gasped as we felt that anxiety build as we cut to an hour earlier. The chopper arrived at the rendezvous point and Harry and the gentleman exited. He said the team were very excited to meet him. Harry laughed. We cut to a dark room, dimly lit by a singular lamp in the corner as the gentleman switched on the main light. One close-up of Harry's smirking face as we saw a group of people turn around. The gentleman would introduce them. Sergei Kravinov, a hunter from Vlogograd, Russia, who has made it his life destiny to hunt and kill his prey. And at the top of his list, Spider-Man. Then there's Adrian Toomes, the Vulture. Spider-Man put him behind bars a few years ago when he was trying to get the money so he could develop a cure for his spinal cancer. Swore revenge on him since that day. Dr. Otto Octavius, the world's lead in biological evolution. Spider-Man shut down his business when he was under the impression of illegal activity being conducted. Otto came to Warscorp after his business fell and together created a suit with four stainless steel tentacles to use in his revenge against Spider-Man. Matt Gargan, aka the Scorpion. He was a private investigator that was sent to follow Spider-Man. During one of their attacks, Gargan was vulnerable and Spider-Man did nothing to save him, leading Gargan paralyzed. Oscott recruited him and gave him a supplement that allowed him to walk again, but he'll never forget what Spider-Man did. And lastly, Flint Marker. He was a small-time crook who was in and out of prison. Spider-Man was responsible for his falsified arrest that cost him four years of his life. Then there's you, Harry, the man in charge. Your father would be proud. Harry laughed as he told him it was time to suit up. Shortly after they had broken into Warscorp and the chambers containing the suits unraveled as the Sinister Six was formed. We got back to Peter at the present moment. Learning Harry had escaped only fueled his anger more. His fists clenched tightly as he imagined the thought of Harry. He becomes determined to find Harry and not to make the same mistake of arresting him. This time, he wants to kill him. We then transition back to Harry as he was telling the group about Spider-Man. His weaknesses are his loved ones, his aunts, anyone he cares about. Craven said to lure their prey, they must have a reason to be lured. You know his loved one, this Aunt May? If we find her, we can use her as bait to catch the real prey. We cut to Harry's grizzled, grind down teeth as he smirked. We cut back to Peter, angry, rage infused, he got back to his Aunt May's to see she wasn't there. As he looked around, he saw the place was a mess. The coffee table had been knocked over and the TV had been left on. It looked like there had been a fight, a struggle. Peter ran upstairs, shouting May's name to no answer. On May's bed, there was a note. It read the words, Can the Spider-Man come out to play? Signed H. Peter ran back downstairs to the TV as he saw an infamous group of criminals calling themselves the Sinister Six were attacking a power plant in the city. One of the hostages has been identified as May Parker. Peter fell to his knees in shock, mirroring the way he did at Gwen's grave. Peter sighed, holding his head in his hands. He looked to May through the TV as we cut to the six. They were destroying a reactor and replacing it with the nuclear weapon that they had created. May was tied up amongst the battle, as we saw the pure, chaotic mind of Harry and the team. Before long, Spider-Man arrived with a vengeance. He stuck to a streetlight beside the battle. He shouted for Harry to let May go. As he was about to fight him, the rest of the group swarmed Peter. Outnumbered and outmatched, Peter was in for the fight of his life. 
He tussled with Craven and Vulture, then Sandman and Scorpion hitting them back to back until they finally got the jump on him. Peter decided as much as he wanted to kill Harry and get this all over with, he had to save May to stop history from repeating itself. Peter would cause a distraction and got May out safely, telling her to run, run as fast as she could. As Peter turned back around, he was met with a blade to the chest. We saw Craven holding the blade as Peter fell to the ground. The rest of the six swarmed Peter as they beat him to a pulp. They busted his lip, shattered his collarbone and broke him in every way possible. Before they managed to kill him, one of the nuclear weapons became defective and it distracted the six. As they looked back to finish Peter, he had disappeared. Harry ragefully told them to split off and find him. He can't be far. We saw Peter sheltering himself away from the battle. He took off his mask, barely able to see from the amount of hits he had endured. He had never been beaten this badly. He needed to check on Aunt May to make sure she was safe. As Peter tried swinging away, he saw he was out of webs. So he had to stumble away on foot. When he did, he got a call from the cats. Peter would ask how she got his number. She said that didn't matter. What matters is that she found something else when she was in Oscorp. Something Norman and Richard Parker worked on together. It's a healing substitute. She said she saw how the Six defeated him. She told him to meet with her at sunset. They cut back to the Six as their vengeance was growing larger. They continued to wreak havoc on the city as there was no Spider-Man to stop them anymore. On a rooftop at dawn, we saw the cats leaning against the ledge of the building. She jolted behind her, seeing Peter. Hesitant bloody and bruised. Where is it? He asked. The cat said he looked like shit. Peter said he wasn't in a mood for games. Where's the healing substance? The cat brought over a cryogenically frozen container with a strange black substance inside. She said it had the code name Symbiote. It's an alien life form built as the treatment for cancer. Peter looked profusely as the cat opened it. The symbiote slithered and slimed its way to Peter, finding an instant attraction. It slivered around his feet as it began making its way up his leg. The thunder crackled and the rain blew storm as the symbiote bonded with Peter. In a matter of seconds, his wounds were healed. His broken bones were healed. We panned from the foggy white lenses of Spider-Man's new suit as we saw him fully suited up with the black symbiote. He felt stronger, he felt more powerful. The cat told him Harry's still out there and he needs to be stopped. Peter told her he would make sure his villainy stops tonight. Back out in the city, the icy snow began dripping from the grey sky. Clouds flooded the city in darkness and dimness as the six were laying waste on Manhattan. Buildings were up in flames, cars thrown across the streets and into the buildings they parked next to. Soon enough, however, they were ambushed. Spider-Man arrived with his symbiotic powers as he came back with rage. His hatred for Harry just continued to grow. He was going to murder him, not before he said hello to the others. Peter was not his usual quippy self. He was quiet. He was deadly. He webbed towards the vulture, riding on his wings as Craven shot multiple arrows at Peter. He didn't even flinch. He didn't even have to move as the tendrils from the suit deflected the incoming shots. Peter would break the vulture's harness as they plummeted out of the sky. He ripped off the vulture's wings and impaled him with the other blades. He continued to punch him over and over and just before they were about to hit the ground, Peter would zip towards the next villain. Vulture was beaten almost to death as Peter targeted Craven. Harry was watching from afar as Peter was ripping apart his team, his plan crumbling. Fall back, everyone, we need to leave now. As Peter held Craven by his fur coat, blood dripping from his knuckle, Harry fled from the scene. We could feel Peter's rage through his mask, his heart pounding. As he dropped Craven's defenseless body to the ground, the cops were approaching. Peter would vanish. We cut to Richard. He was watching from the subway as he saw the look of intimidation in his eyes. He immediately grabbed his phone to call Peter as there was nothing but static. Peter, if you get this, call me back immediately. The suit you're wearing, I tried to bury it. You need to take it off or else you'll be consumed by his power. As the music intensified, we cut to Peter. He climbed up the side of his wall before entering his room. The symbiote retracted under his clothes as Peter smirked. He saw the missed call from his dad as he left his room. He saw May on the sofa, unable to sleep. She asked where Peter had been and why he missed group earlier. Peter just scoffed. Seriously? Group? That's all you can think about after what happened? May told him at least she's thinking about him. Peter will pause. If you thought about me, then you wouldn't have even suggested it in the first place. 
I should have been you, instead of Ben. May asked how he dared say that. Peter ignored her as he went to go clear his mind. We heard Peter swinging. The moonlight reflected on his suit as he began talking to himself, agreeing with himself. Except he no longer referred to himself as I. Instead, we. Peter soon noticed this, questioning his actions. The morals Ben taught him shining through. Peter would check his father's voicemail, only to hear the frightening reality of the symbiote. Peter knew he had to remove this toxic waste before it consumed his mind. Peter arrived at a church as he approached the bell. Unaware of its weakness, Peter tried ripping it off. But the symbiote, it wrapped its tendrils around Peter and it held a grip so tightly, he was unable to loosen its grip. He slipped and stumbled into the giant bell as its ringing echoed through the church. Peter was screaming as its grip was loosened. He eventually began ripping away its power, but suddenly, Peter's vision faded white, blurry. He saw to his left was a store. He heard echoes of his past self telling the cashier that it wasn't his policy. There was a loud gunshot as Peter jolted his head to the left. On the floor was a body. A pool of bright red blood was underneath as it popped against the dreamy white sequence. Peter closed his eyes. He shook his head and told the symbiote to stay out of his mind. He shut his eyes for a moment, hoping that when he reopened them, he would be broken free from its grasp. As he did though, he was at the bottom of the clock tower. No, 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 Peter tried to escape, but he was restrained. He heard a faint scream as he tried to catch her. She fell right through his arms. Gwen was unable to be saved again. Peter broke out into tears. He fell to his knees once again as he cried to the ground. Her body was replaced by the grave. Peter was emotional. He couldn't comprehend the pain he was feeling. Suddenly, a hand was placed on his shoulder. Peter? His head shot up, confused, hearing that familiar tone. As he turned around, he almost collapsed. Panning to the left, we saw Gwen standing there. He fell into her arms, telling her he was so, so sorry. Gwen told Peter it wasn't his fault. Her fate was inevitable. But she told him she didn't regret anything. But what about our life together? England. Your home is New York, Peter. It's in your blood. It never would have worked. I can make it work. I could have. I know I could have. You can't spend your life caught up on what could have happened. You have to focus on the future. I don't know how to go on without you. Then don't. Take me with you, Peter. I'll always be here. You know that. As the two kissed, reunited, the white crispness of the scene became infested by the symbiote's darkness. Peter held Gwen's hand tightly as the symbiote took its villainous form, telling Peter he was a failure. He failed everyone in his life he loved. His parents, his uncle, Gwen, all because of him. Peter would say something, but he believed it. He knew it was true. The symbiote said he can assure he never makes those mistakes again. Let it be in control. Peter looked back at Gwen's grave. He saw flashbacks of her and Ben's death as he fell to his knees, telling it to take him. As it slowly slithered towards Peter, Gwen dragged him away. She told him he can't save everyone, no matter how hard you try. It's still his responsibility to protect those around him, not that thing. Peter was torn. On one side was the light, Gwen, May, everything he cared about, but still the risk of continuing to make those mistakes, and on the other was the darkness, but a guarantee he would never let anyone die again. He had no idea what to choose, he was torn. The suspense built as Peter looked into Gwen's eyes. He saw the life they shared together. He smiled. I don't need you. I know that now. I'll always have my family. And yeah, I'll make mistakes. But mistakes are what make us stronger. The only reason we fall is so we can learn to get back up again. Instead of the symbiote taking Peter's hand, he would take Gwen's, as he was broken from the trance. Peter was able to break free of the symbiote's grasp. Peter watched it squirm for it to take him back as he looked at it. A changed man. He smiled knowing Gwen was watching over him as we transitioned to the remains of the six. Harry was arguing with the gentleman as he told him the plan was failing. 
Fear said not to panic. Don't panic. Half our team has been wiped out. We're going to lose if we fight him again. You're not an optimistic man, are you, Harry? No, but I am a vengeful one. Harry told the team to suit up, but they refused. They told Harry he can shove his team. They're out. You serious? Bastards. Get out of here. Now. Gargan told Harry he'll get himself killed. He laughed. He grabbed the gentleman's gun and shot him in the face. We heard Harry's demonic laugh as we cut to Peter, slowly walking back to Maze, with a sudden look on his face. He was not gently. The door creaked open as we saw May, fragile behind the door. She looked at Peter with a blank expression. Wait, before you say anything, I'm sorry. What I said before was horrible. I didn't mean that. I love Ben, like I love you. I couldn't ask for a better person to keep me safe. You were there for me when nobody else was. I appreciate everything you do for me, May. I'm sorry. Ah, oh, Peter. I know you could never have meant those words. I know. I know everything, Spider-Man. What? How long have you known? For a while. I never wanted you to worry. I did. But that's okay. Because I'm so proud of you. For all those lives you've saved, Peter. You deserve to be happy. And if this makes you happy, then it makes me happy. I believe in you. The two hugged with passion as we transitioned to Oscorp. The hallways were dark, gritty. Bodies scattered the floors, blood drizzled down the walls. Screams could be heard in the distance as their voices struck fear into our hearts. Harry had gone insane. He went on a killing rampage at Oscorp. He killed everyone. Not just killing them, but mutilating their bodies and leaving a trail of nothing but grinded flesh and broken bones. The labs were smashed and exploded by goblin grenades. Oscorp and its reputation had been destroyed in minutes by Harry's attack. This is where it all started, and this is where it will all end. Right here at Oscorp. Harry had obtained the nuclear weapons, and he was going to destroy the city. All to get back at Peter. We cut to the outside as the city was in blazes. The Six had previously laid waste to the streets and Harry was about to finish what they had started. The Bugle would be reporting on the attack. The city was in terror. It felt like the end. Peter saw the broadcast and got a call from his dad, who told him it was time. We got to the upstairs. Peter reached into the closet. He pulled out a box as we saw inside was a damaged red and blue suit, a cracked left lens rips and tears. Even though it was broken, it still held its message. Peter suited up, grabbing his web shooters. We zoomed into his eye as we cut back to Oscorp. Harry would impale Mencken, getting his revenge as he killed him instantly. As he did, Harry heard a voice. Harry! He smirked and laughed vigorously. As he turned on his glider, Peter was standing there at the end of the hallway. This has to end. Now. You took away everything from me. You won't take this away. Listen to what you're saying, Harry. All this pain you've caused. You're not getting away with this. You're gonna kill me? I didn't come here to kill you. I came here to talk. Talk? That's cute. You should leave the talking to your girlfriend. Oh wait. Peter clenched his fist. He started attacking Harry. They busted through the walls and corridors, bringing everything in their path. One punch followed the next as blood splattered across the screen. Peter disabled Harry's glider as they brutally went hand to hand. No weapons, no webs, just their fists and anger towards each other. Harry grabbed Peter and slammed his head against the wall. He grabbed a sharp piece of debris and sliced it down Peter's back. He screamed out in pain. Peter would kick the weapon out of his hand and headbutt him. He punched him in the chest, breaking through his armor. Harry's systems went down. Peter punched Harry in the face, cutting Harry's eye. Years I've waited for this. What you started. I didn't want to hurt you, Harry. All I ever wanted to do was help you. Like I said before, you take away hope. You don't give it. 
Peter stabbed Harry through the broken armor. The two stared at each other as Harry made a run for it. Peter chased Harry through Oscorp. Harry crawled up the elevator wires as Peter zipped up using his webs. As they made it to the top floor, Peter kicked Harry through a table. He leaped on top of him, punching him over and over as Peter took off his mask. He started strangling Harry as he looked dead into his eyes as he did. Harry had a look of scarce as he pleaded for Peter to stop. Peter took his hands from around Harry's neck. Harry's tears soon turned into a demonic laugh as he stabbed Peter through the chest with a hidden blade from his wrist of his suit. Harry approached the nuclear weapons. He set the timer. In 30 seconds, the entire city would explode and Peter was laying half dead on the ground. He began crawling towards Harry as we heard insult after insult. Peter said nothing as he just crawled his way to Harry. He remembered to Gwen, Aunt May, Uncle Ben, his father, all the people who have helped him. Peter found the courage to stand. We heard the seconds turn to five and onward as Peter had no other option. He told Harry he was sorry as he impaled him with the remnants of his own glider. With two seconds left, Peter shut down the reaction as he fell before Harry's body. Harry said to Peter he was sorry. Peter said nothing. Harry let out his last breath as Peter cried over his body. We cut to the outside of Oscorp as the sign flickered, eventually failing to illuminate the night. The darkness faded us to black as we cut to a few weeks later. Harry's death had been made public. Richard had used all the files him and Peter gathered and Oscorp was permanently shut down. The entire thing was brought to the bugle by Peter. Jameson paid him enough to finally move into his own apartment. Richard helped him move in as Peter claimed they had one last stop. We ran across the street before arriving at May's house. Once again, the door creaked open as we saw May's shocked and speechless expression. Richard turned around as May approached him. They stared at each other. May smiled. She wrapped her arms around Richard gently as the two hugged tightly. Peter would smile as he joined them. We cut to a modern apartment. It was dark. On the floor, we saw the cat. She was reading Peter's scoop on Oscorp's takedown and scrunched the paper in anger. She stared at Spider-Man's picture as she angrily clenched her fist. Before the credits, we cut to Richard's new lab in the city. He had opened his own laboratory, hoping to create a difference with his son, Peter. As he walked in the lab, we saw Richard was busy. He told Peter he had something to tell him. Ever since your mother died, I've always wondered if there was a way to bring her back. Imagine it. For years, I tried and failed until now. I think it might finally be possible, Peter. What might be possible? Here, Richard handed Peter a serum. I ran all the trials. I think this might work. Do you trust me? Peter would inject the serum into his vein. He yelled out in pain as the papers began flying around the room. Peter fell to the ground as Richard helped him and made him sure he was okay. There was a long pause. Peter? 